In the heart of Springfield, New Jersey, a young and awkward boy was born on March 14, 1979. His name was Dan. Raised alongside his sister, Dana, Dan's early life was marked by an inventive spirit, but also at the same time, it was just riddled with awkwardness, social isolation, and general ridicule typical of a child in high school age. After graduating from Jonathan Dayton High School in 1997, Dan ventured to Boston University, where he studied advertising, but soon found that his calling was a different direction. To Dan, it was music and comedy that beckoned him to leave to Philadelphia, where the first notes of his future career began to play. See, Dan might have been awkward and weird, but somehow that felt like it was his biggest strength. It was something he ultimately would end up relying on. And choosing to embrace that awkwardness, he decided to make it his signature as he created a persona to use in a strange comedy band he developed with his friend Brian. Brian also created a persona, and the two of them became known no longer as Danny Avedon and Brian Wack, but instead Danny Sexbang and Ninja Brian. And thus, Ninja Sex Party was born. You are the hero with the heart of a god. You're barely the size of a mouse. Throughout Danny's entire career, his awkward, confused, and uncertain personality was something he always seemed to feel self-conscious of, and he was, by all terms, an outcast. He chose, however, to embrace this portion of himself to understand that he needed not to be changed, but instead to love who he was, awkwardness and all. He began to find those who loved him, not for who he tried to be, but instead, for who he was. This journey of self-discovery is well summed up in one of Ninja Sex Party's most heartfelt songs, Danny Don't You Know, in which the following lyrics are sung directly to Danny's past self, encouraging him to know that he is worthy of love. You're still a nerdy kid inside, but now you've finally found your tribe. Hear the crowd roar. and give them what they came for. Outcasts are an interesting topic because you can't really define them in one way or another. Ultimately, an outcast is just somebody who feels casted out from society. And that could happen for a number of reasons, specifically based on the society that you live in. But typically it's because you have characteristics that are considered not very well liked in whatever culture that you live in. That's most of the time what creates an outcast. And so you'd think in games like D&D or any other TTRPG, this would be a shoe in I mean, you're creating characters who go out, risk their lives, go on crazy adventures with a group of a bunch of weirdos. Wouldn't you all technically be outcasts at that point? But we're talking about something a little bit more specific here. Not just an outcast in the typical TTRPG main character sense, but instead an outcast to even the group itself. Somebody who is shunned by society. Perhaps your class combo is just something that's very dangerous and literally because of the lore of the world, you are shunned from everybody else. Perhaps you're playing a wild magic sorcerer, in which case anytime you cast magic, you could cause a fireball on yourself or you could turn everybody into sheep or make them lose their hair. Uh, what's wrong with my face? What is so, going on? Tell me true. What is this? I don't know. Is it, so is he just fully covered in hair? No, it was just like hair like matted to his face from the sweat. But like, what? His like, hair? Or yeah, what? you wipe it and it comes free and you look and there's oh. just a bunch of black hair in your hand. Uh -oh. Does it grow back though? I just, I start doing this. Yeah, you just start hitting it, and as you do, more hair begins to fall out the back of your head. Oh. You start seeing patches of hair, uh, patches of skin showing up throughout the scalp. Oh, oh wait, it's wait. not its not growing hair, it's you falling off. Hair. Wait, hold on, what about my beard and my, my bow bun? So at this point, you realize that your, your beard, as you've been doing this, patches have been scraping off. Oh, oh no. What? What about down below? <laughs> No, don't touch anything. Okay. <laughs> it's all coming off because you're wiping it. Are my eyebrows still? It's all or nothing else. Did he lose his oh, eyebrows? Yeah. Oh, well, at this point, uh, you should just... Did, you don't know. They're patchy. Yeah, don't gonna... touch it! <laughs> I'm going to touch his eyebrows. No, don't touch it! Mate hand. Armor of Agnes! <laughs> it would be pretty natural for you to be an outcast at that point. Nobody would like for you to be around. Or you could be a warlock and while everybody else around you technically has magic, they're all sorcerers, they're all wizards, they're all druids, but warlocks are specifically outcasts because they do not have magic that they understand, they instead borrow it from somebody else and are therefore dangerous. Now, both of those examples focus on magic and I don't think that should be any surprise. Magic is a pretty big portion of any world building in a setting or a system that uses magic. It doesn't have to be magic. The point is you're an outcast for one or another reason that makes it beyond the typical adventurer. You're not just outcast from society, 
you are outcast because you genuinely shouldn't be in that group, supposedly. And one thing that I didn't mention before that is very important to remember is that outcasts very typically in stories will reclaim that term, outcast. I mean, how many times have we seen stories about people who have been pushed out of society and they take that as their own? They take that almost as a badge of honor because they're different than everybody else and they're willing to be proud of that and they refuse to back down from that. And while that's an empowering story, it doesn't really work out so well when you're playing in, a, well, a party and a group of adventurers because reclaiming that, being proud of that means that you're gonna keep pushing people away. Typically, if you're gonna play what we expect from this archetype, it will not work with the party. And it's not hard to describe why this is difficult to play. Pretty much any time that I talk about a character archetype, the reason it's difficult to play is because it's a difficult archetype to make fit within a group. Because you're supposed to play with your party, you're supposed to play well with the people at the table, while still enveloping and creating a character who's supposed to be an outcast. You want to play out the character traits that you envisioned. And so this leads to the question, what do you do about this? The easy answer, of course, is to ask your character to simply begin to build bonds with the rest of the party. But I also understand the truth, which is that most people want to play an outcast to explore being an outcast, not to just automatically fix that problem. So how do you explore such a concept without alienating yourself from everybody else at the table. Well, the first thing that I would do, and it is the most obvious, is to determine why your character feels like an outcast in the first place. I mentioned several examples near the beginning of the video that revolved around magic, but they don't just have to be about magic. It could have been an action that your character took that was extremely taboo. Maybe your character killed somebody that definitely shouldn't have been killed, like the Pope or something. I don't know, just as an example. Or maybe your character has done something or has been accused of something that nobody can forgive them for regardless of if they did it or not. Most settings have a large pantheon of gods, so having your character having been cursed by a god because of some sort of disrespect to them is also a great way to automatically just make your character forcibly outcasted from everywhere. I mean, one of the most original stories in the Bible, you know, Cain and Abel, had such a storyline like that. Because Cain killed Abel, spoiler warnings, I guess, for the Bible, I don't know if I'm gonna put a spoiler warning for the fucking Bible. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk the story sea. I can't, I can't, can't. This is not worth the bit. I'm losing my mind. But when Cain killed Abel, the story goes that he was then marked with the mark of Cain, which meant that nobody would go near him and he would have to go out in the world on his own and try and survive. He was marked and everybody knew it and they knew not to get close to him because he had made an enemy of God himself. So yeah, that's a very typical story that a lot of people would probably gain inspiration from. But not only this, you also have to find the fear of the character. What are they afraid will be proven true if they get close to others? Most of the time when you're outcasted, you are afraid that if you try to reintegrate with society, something will happen. Most of the time, this fear is rejection. And I honestly don't think that it's bad that that's more often than not the answer. Rejection is something many people do not want to have because in order to be rejected, you must first open yourself up and be vulnerable. And if you've already been cast out of society, then Lord knows you're not gonna wanna do it again and be rejected again. So yeah, you're probably gonna be afraid of that, but it doesn't have to be just rejection. Maybe, you know, you are that wild magic sorcerer and your fear is you're gonna harm everybody you care about. Finding the fear that your character has is very important in defining the motivation of why they have taken on this outcast role. Because most of the time being an outcast is only partially because of society. The other half is you, because you've decided to push yourself out of that. You've decided to define yourself by that and reclaim the title, like I mentioned earlier. Now, it's not as simple as that. You're not gonna victim blame your character, of course. It's not their fault that they got cast out, but if they have been cast out and they're refusing to try and reintegrate with any other society, like, I don't know, the party, well then yes, that's also partially on your character. It is a lesson they must learn and an arc that they need to go on, which is a good one. It's not bad. But in order to make this an interesting story, to actually involve yourself within the party, you need to do one very specific thing that I honestly think does a ton to make this archetype really work well in a story. And that's identify how that fear that you have manifests within each party member. What I mean by this is we'll take the wild magic sorcerer again. Maybe you are afraid of hurting everybody. So how does that fear manifest in everybody? 
How do you see that in each of the individual party members? You see the rogue as somebody who's very cunning, but not exactly the smartest in the room. And you're very afraid that if you ever use your magic, you're gonna cause something that they're not going to know how to deal with. Or maybe one of the other party members, the cleric, is incredibly innocent, and they don't deserve to be harmed by magic. And you constantly are terrified that you're going to ruin that innocence because of that. And then the barbarian is terrifying. You're afraid that if one time you use magic and it accidentally hurts the barbarian, that rage is gonna get turned against you. Rogue! Then what this does is it makes the story about the party not just about you being isolated from the party because that's the main issue that tends to show up when you tell these types of stories. You need to find a way to bring them all together and that's true for basically any archetype. No matter what you're playing, you need to find a way to get the other party members involved. That's the purpose of the story that you're telling. And every single video that I make on these sort of things will always have that advice just in different fonts, because it is important. And then lastly, one of the main things that you need to do once you have identified the fear and how the fear manifests in each party member is to actively search for a chance to see the party members prove your fear wrong. Maybe the cleric is not nearly as innocent as you thought, and you get to see them use their magic in a very terrifying way and realize, Maybe they understand me more than I thought. Or maybe you do finally accidentally cast that fireball on yourself. It burns the barbarian and the barbarian just keeps fighting alongside you and makes sure that you're okay and that your hit points are all right. Okay, so maybe that rage is not so easily turned against you. Maybe you keep a look at the rogue and they do something pretty intelligent when it comes involved with magic and you realize, oh, uh, maybe I can trust them to handle this sort of stuff. You have to actively look for the character to prove you wrong or right. There's nothing wrong with doing a negative character arc in your story. It could just go downhill very quickly if you're not careful, but it is an interesting story. And the whole purpose is to tell an interesting story. Now, the issue with this type of exploration is it causes you to need to focus heavily on remembering specific details and watching other player actions which can be difficult if too much is going on, especially in combat. Fortunately, I have an easy solution to keep combat moving smoothly so you can keep an eye on the other players. That's right, it's a, it's a fucking ad, except not really because we're not, we're not sponsored. It's, it, someday I'll get good at actually doing these ad reads on the not ad. I'm holding these upside down. Yeah, okay, no, Geek Tech Games have been a long, uh, a long partner to the channel and they have sent me tons of products for my games that I have used many times. They are amazing and their premier product is their 2D miniatures. They're little paper miniatures that you can stick in a stand and set it on your battle map. And the reason they're amazing is I typically go to my players' houses to play, which means I have to take all those minis with me and I do not have the space to hold them. This kind of product is amazing for that because you can stick literally hundreds of minis in the pocket of your backpack and take them. It's incredible. If you wanna check them out, please go check the link in the description. I'm trying to help out all the partners to the channel because they've honestly done a lot for me and I would like to give back to them and it also helps support the channel. So yeah, anyways, uh, back to the video. <laughs> anyways, uh, lastly and most importantly, I'd like to return to the story at the start of the video, Danny. Danny didn't find his tribe as the song suggests by becoming a person that needed to be loved. He found that by finding out how to be himself. The nerdy, awkward, ridiculous character he played was based off of his own experiences. The persona people came to love was Dan just being himself, although pretty exaggerated. In order to play an outcast in a way that feels satisfying, I truly believe the exploration needs to focus on the individual realizing that they're worth loving as they are. It doesn't mean they shouldn't grow. It doesn't mean they shouldn't feel the need to change who they are in the terms of they need to overcome their weaknesses. But it is so important to remember when telling these types of stories that a weakness is just the other side of a strength. It is two sides of a coin. I am easily distractible. That is a weakness and it causes issues a lot. But at the same time, my distractibility allows me to focus on a lot of things when I make YouTube videos. It allows me to write a script while simultaneously working on a thumbnail. And sometimes that's necessary. There's no such thing as a weakness that is only bad. It just needs to be trained and understood. You don't have to change who you are. You're worthy of love. No matter who you are, no matter what you deal with, you deserve to be loved. 
and it's important for these characters to recognize this or go down the other route. Go through a negative character arc of realizing that maybe they feel like they don't deserve to be loved. I think in the heart of these games, that's the type of stories that we tell. And this is a great archetype for telling that type of story. Yes, the wild magic sorcerer is dangerous, but they're powerful. And with the right competent people around them, they could be more powerful than they ever thought. Yes, the warlock has magic that other people don't understand and could potentially be dangerous, but they were also willing to make a sacrifice to gain that power to achieve the goals necessary, and they'd be willing to do the same thing for their party. Understanding the weakness and the strength that comes with that weakness and learning to hone it to be something truly powerful and allowing the rest of the party to be around you to supplement where you might fail is the heart of TTRPGs. And truly, I don't think there's any better way to play this type of character. So. Wife, you want to do the call to action? Like, comment, subscribe, go click on the links in Jay's bio and check the products out. Are you a Taylor Swift fan or not? In the comments, let us know. Yeah, we got we got any T-Swizzle fans in the comments? I, I will put that, oh, it's from like 2009 where Taylor did that rap song. I'll put a little segment of that she right has, at the end. Uh, done, uh, she did a performance with Nicki Minaj as well. Oh, really? Yeah. You shorties never thought I dreamed about rapping hardcore. I will have already cut the video at this point. <laughs>